So if you've clicked on this video, we're going to talk about the refrigeration cycle and we're going to explain it. That's why the word explain is there. Now, my name is Gary McCready. I'm from HVAC Know It All. And maybe you clicked on this video through the article. Okay. There's also a podcast as well that is included within that article. And if you're watching it on YouTube at the bottom, guys, there is a link to that article and there's a link to that podcast as well. The refrigeration cycle, what is it? Well, it can be complicated, but it can be very simplified if we break it down the right way. So we're going to try to break it down for you as simple as we can, okay? For those of you that are learning, maybe for those of you that have been in the trade for a while but just really haven't taken the time to, to understand what the refrigeration cycle is. Essentially, it's a science, okay? And if we don't understand that science, we're not going to be as good at our job, service, install, maintenance, repair, as we could be. So let's get to know the refrigeration cycle a little bit. Before we get into it, there's three words we really need to understand, and those three words I've written here, superheat, saturation, and subcooling. Now, if you look here, equals boiling point. The reason I wrote that is because saturation, as it pertains to this subject, refrigerant and the refrigeration cycle, when we talk about a saturated refrigerant, we're talking about it at its boiling point. Superheat, I've written in red because anything above saturation or boiling point is superheated. Subcooling obviously is in blue because anything below the saturation or boiling point is subcooled. So we're going to move on. We're going to talk about each one of these individually. We're going to use water as an example because water is the most relatable when it comes to boiling. All right, so we're going to talk about subcooling first, and we're going to try to keep these three blocks sort of very similar through the three examples, subcooling, saturation, and superheat. So water at sea level boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. Now, in the U.S. and Canada, when we take our subcooling and superheat readings, we tend to use degrees Fahrenheit as the unit of measure. So we're going to stick to that here. Now, anybody that's done cooking in the past has used a big pot of water like this to maybe cook some pasta. Now we filled this this pot up with water. The water is at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't have that rolling boil we need before we put that pasta in there, okay? Because the water boils at 212 degrees, that is the saturation or boiling point. If we come along and we stick a probe in there, we measure the water and get the actual temp, and the actual temp is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. What we're going to do is we're going to take that 75 degrees Fahrenheit away from the saturation or boiling point because it's the actual temperature and we're going to get 137 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that number? Well, that number is our subcooling. Okay, we have 75 degrees of water, but because our saturation point is 212, we minus the actual from that, we're left with a number. That number is our subcooling every single time. If we move this number to 80, whatever this number down here is, is our subcooling. If we move this number to 60, for example, whatever number we have down here is our subcooling. So you got to remember when you have a subcooling reading that you want to take in refrigeration, we take the saturation point of that refrigerant, we minus the actual temperature, and that's how we get our subcooling. So using water as an example there, I think will help you with that. Okay, so let's talk about superheat. This portion of the diagram has stayed the same. This portion and that portion has changed a little bit. We're still at 212 degrees in the pot. It's still a liquid, it's still a vapor, still rising out of the pot. So let's say for a second, we gotta think outside the box here because when we're cooking pasta, we're not gonna be doing this or thinking about this. So let's say this vapor rising up, we could somehow grab it with a bubble or container or whatever and inject or add more heat, additional heat to this vapor. So now we're taking this vapor from a saturation point, liquid and vapor, and it's at 212 degrees, but now we're raising the temperature of that vapor to 220 degrees, for example. So now what that does is that changes our actual temperature to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Our saturation or boiling point still stays the same, okay, because at sea level, water boils at 212 degrees. So if we take the actual temperature and we deduct the saturation point or the boiling point, we're left with eight degrees. So this vapor up here has eight degrees of superheat because it's eight degrees above boiling point. That's how superheat works. It's very, very simple guys. So in refrigeration, 
when you're taking a superheat reading, if you put your, your probe on that suction line, all right, and you take an actual temperature of that suction line, and it's 50 degrees, but the saturation temperature of the refrigerant is 40, well, guess what? You have 10 degrees of superheat. So this example with water, I think, is going to help you with that. Just remember, vapor that's superheated is going to be higher than the saturation point. Whatever the difference is between the actual and the saturation point is going to be your superheat when we're talking about water. And that relates to refrigerant in the exact same way. We are going to deal with the four major components now. Compressor, condenser, metering device, and evaporator. We've dealt with superheat, subcooling, and saturation. Let's move on to this because this is super important to know. And just so you know, guys, these four components and concepts remain true through air conditioning and refrigeration. Just the applications change. So we're going to spend a couple of seconds on each one. Then we're going to draw out the complete cycle showing refrigerant flow. Okay, so the compressor. Its job, once it starts up, once it receives power, is to pressurize the system and move that refrigerant through the system. Some will argue that it's not a pump, but for argument's sake for this video, we can call it a vapor pump because it's not designed to pump liquid. It's designed to pump vapor and vapor only. The condenser. Refrigeration. Basically, we're taking heat from a place where we don't want it and moving it to a place where it doesn't matter. The condenser takes that heat and moves it to the place where it doesn't matter. It's rejecting heat from the system and putting it somewhere else. We've all walked by uh, a residential AC, maybe if we have one at home. The warm air coming off of that, that's the condenser rejecting its heat to the atmosphere. The metering device, there's all different kinds of metering devices. There's cap tubes or capillary or capillary tube, depending on where you live is how you say it, TX valves, um, automatic expansion valves. All we need to know right now about the metering device is it regulates refrigerant flow from one side of the system to the other side of the system. And we'll get into that when I draw the cycle up. The evaporator's job, okay, is to absorb heat. So if we're in a residential application and we have a blower fan moving across the evaporator, the evaporator takes heat from the air. It absorbs the heat from the home, okay, and then moves it back through the system starting with the compressor pumping, okay? So now we've covered the four major components briefly. I'm gonna draw this cycle out for you guys so you can see what it looks like when it's in full activation mode. So here's where the magic happens, guys. This is the full cycle. We've covered saturation, we've covered superheat, we've covered subcooling. The four major components we've covered, and here they are, the compressor, the condenser, the metering device, and the evaporator. Additional information here before we begin. This is the discharge line right here that leaves the compressor. This is the liquid line that leaves the condenser. And this is the suction line that leaves the evaporator and heads back to the compressor to make one complete cycle. And just so you guys are aware, when you see dots, that corresponds to vapor in the system. When you see a full line like this, fully colored in, that's liquid. Same here. Dots are vapor full solid is liquid okay so what we're going to do here is going to go through the cycle and explain it sort of in detail as to what happens when and where so the compressor it's going to start up okay what it does is pressurize the system it starts to move that refrigerant around the system so we have the arrows here so we're going to come out of the compressor through the discharge line the discharge line is a superheated vapor remember we talked about what superheat is it's anything above saturation so this line here is superheated, it's not saturated. I'm gonna tell you where two points are that are saturated within the system. For argument's sake, okay, we're gonna pretend, well, not really pretend, but for argument's sake, we're gonna say we're saturated in the middle of the condenser where we have a liquid and a vapor at the same time, and we're saturated in the middle of the evaporator where we have liquid and vapor at the same time. So we're gonna move through this system. Superheated vapor. We're in the condenser now. Remember, the condenser's job is to reject heat to a place where it doesn't matter. So the discharge gas is gonna move in. It is high temperature, high pressure. So what the condenser does is start to cool that refrigerant, that vapor refrigerant. So as we cool it, we're de-superheating. We're removing that superheat. We're bringing that to saturation. 
Once we bring it to saturation, we're going to further cool it. We're going to further cool it, and we're going to turn it to a full liquid, and we're going to start to subcool that liquid. That's why we're a full liquid there. So we go from a superheated vapor to saturation to subcooled liquid. That's what the condenser's job is, is to reject that heat. Now we move through the liquid line. The liquid line is a subcooled liquid, as we talked about. So it's below saturation. So it's got some subcooling there. And it's a full column of liquid that moves through that liquid line. It's the only place in the system, essentially, where you're going to have liquid, okay? This side and that side, it's going to be vapor, because remember, we don't want the compressor to pump liquid, only vapor. So now that we have left the condenser, we're going to move down the liquid line. Now remember, the liquid line is a full column of liquid. We are a subcooled liquid, so we are below saturation here. Remember, the liquid below saturation that's been subcooled is only liquid, so we only have liquid in here. We don't have any vapor. That's in theory, okay? In theory of the refrigeration cycle. We're gonna hit the metering device here. Now, the metering device's job is to regulate flow from this side of the system to this side of the system, the condenser side to the evaporator side. The difference between the two sides here is that the condenser side is high pressure, high temperature. We have low pressure, low temperature. Now, the liquid line is still at high pressure, but we've brought that temperature down, okay? Now, we're gonna hit that metering device. What we're gonna do is we're gonna flash in to the evaporator, flash gas. That's a definition of its own. So basically, when we hit that metering device, we're gonna hit a restriction. We're gonna drop the pressure of the system, and we're gonna flash refrigerant in here. Now, rule of thumb here is 75% liquid, 25% vapor. That is a rule of thumb that I learned many, many years ago, and really we can't see what's going on inside of there, but this sort of gives us an indication of what might be happening. So we're gonna flash into the evaporator side of the system through the metering device. And as you can see, we have a lot of liquid here that we have to boil off. And how do we boil off that liquid? Well, the evaporator's job is to absorb heat. Okay, remember we talked about potentially having a residential setup, a blower fan pushing air across the evaporator. The evaporator absorbs heat from the air. As it absorbs heat from the air, the liquid in here starts to boil off. And as it boils off, we have more and more vapor. As we get to the very end of the evaporator, we still have some vapor there that's absorbing additional heat. That additional heat is known as superheat, as we talked about earlier. So superheat is anything above saturation. So the evaporator's job is to absorb the heat. We're flashing in from the metering device right here. Okay, flash gas, 75% liquid, 25% vapor rule of thumb, and we're gonna start to absorb heat to boil off any liquid that's in the evaporator. So what that does is while it's absorbing heat from the air, the air coming off the other side of the evaporator is cooler because we've absorbed heat. So the air coming out the registers in your home is cooler because the evaporator has absorbed the heat out of that air. Okay, so we're gonna move down the suction line now. The suction line, as we just talked about, is gonna be a superheated vapor because we've absorbed all the liquid. Any additional heat we're absorbing in the evaporator is now gonna be superheat. So now we're gonna come down the suction line. Here's the arrow coming back to the compressor and we're gonna start the function all over again. Okay, something else we should touch on here, guys, is that the compressor itself is generating heat. There's a motor inside which generates heat and there's a compression cycle inside which also generates heat. So we have our evaporator that absorbs heat. We have our superheated vapor moving down the suction line, moves into the compressor. The compressor is generating heat. So we're moving from low to high, generating some heat in that compressor. All that heat comes to the condenser and it's rejected to somewhere we don't want. So absorbing heat, generating heat, rejecting heat. I thought I'd touch on that before we end this video off. Thanks for watching again, guys. My name is Gary McCready. I'm from HVAC Know It All. This was the Refrigeration Cycle. 2021 is gonna provide some more information for you guys. So hit that subscribe button, guys. Check out my podcast, the HVAC Know It All podcast, and check out HVACKnowItAll.com because we're gonna bring you some more relevant and educational content in 2021. Happy HVACing.